Hello everyone, welcome back to Word for the Week. And it is our joy once again that we can open up the Word of God uh, during the week uh, and we can learn and study His Word together. So for our lesson this week, shall we turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. And for this lesson, we will look at verse 18 to 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22. Uh, I will be reading it from here. Uh, so you can open up your Bibles and read it together with me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, Eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. May God bless his words. The question that we have for this week's study is this. How can the suffering of Christ encourage and empower us in our own unjust sufferings? How can the suffering of Christ encourage and empower us in our own unjust sufferings? This section, verses 18 to 22, is still a continuation of what Peter has been teaching these believers about standing their ground in suffering that started from chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. That, is, that was our last lesson. And in that last lesson, we have learned how we should stand our ground through unjust sufferings. And we have learned that we honor Christ in persecution as we reasonably and respectfully stand firm by our faith while retaining a good conscience. We can reason out respectfully of why we stand firm by our faith, but we also must retain a good conscience. That was the principle of standing our ground in unjust sufferings. But Peter further gives us an example. And there is no better example of standing ground through unjust sufferings than the example of Christ. Verse 13 to 17 is the principle. Verses 18 to 22 is our example of going through unjust sufferings. Take note that in this epistle, 1 Peter, this is not the first time Peter invoked the example of Christ through suffering. Because he already did that in chapter 2 verses 21 to 25. But what's the difference between that example and this one? Now, in that example, Peter told us of how Jesus responded to unjust sufferings. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He did not threaten them, even though they did um, malicious things against him without any uh, good enough reason. But here, in verses uh, 18 to 22, Peter tells us of the result. So in chapter 2, Peter tells us of how he responded, but here Peter tells us of the result of Jesus standing his ground, enduring through unjust sufferings. So our question for this study is, how can the suffering of Christ encourage and empower us in our own unjust sufferings? Peter starts verse 18 by saying, For Christ also once suffered for sins. If you notice the first word there in, the, uh, in verse 18, it's for, because, it's a reason. He wants us to think, he wants these believers to think of another reason that they would stand their ground. And this is, is his example. Christ also suffered once for sins. Peter wished to encourage his readers in their suffering by again reminding them that even Christ suffered unjustly because it was God's will, like Peter said in verse 17. However, ultimately, Christ was marvelously triumphant to the point of being exalted to the right hand of God, while all those demons who were behind his suffering were made forever to be subjected to him. That is what we will find in verse 22. That's in the end. But by Peter saying Christ also suffered once for sins, it is a key statement on the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Because under the old covenant, the Jewish people offered sacrifice after sacrifice and then repeated it all the next year, especially at the Passover. But Christ's one sacrifice for sins, 
of such perpetual validity that it was sufficient for all and would never need to be repeated again. He suffered for sins only once and it was enough. But the one who suffered there, Peter tells us here, the righteous for the unrighteous. He suffered and died as the righteous one in place of the unrighteous. This is another statement of the sinlessness of Christ and of his substitutionary and vicarious atonement. He who personally never sinned and had no sin nature took the place of sinners. For what purpose? Look at verse 18, that he might bring us to God. He suffered in order to bring us to God. Because in so doing, Christ satisfied God's just penalty for sin required by the law and opened the way to God for all who repentantly believe. He brought us who believe to God. Whether uh, He brought us to God whether in this life spiritually or in the next life fully. Now the third phrase here, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, there are two interpretations for this phrase or for this thought here. One interpretation of this phrase is that in the flesh means in the fi visible physical realm in which Jesus was crucified and in the spirit means in the invisible spiritual realm where Christ now lives. That interpretation believes that in the, in the physical realm, Jesus was put to death in his flesh but in the spirit, in the spiritual realm, he is always alive. But another view of which I agree is that Jesus died physically but was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. So he died a violent physical execution that terminated his earthly life. His flesh or his humanness was dead for three days, but he was made alive by the Spirit or in his spirit he was alive always alive so the next phrase here in verse 19 peter further uh, tells us of what happened to christ in his sufferings verse 19 in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when god's patience waited in the days of noah while the ark was being prepared now um, talking about the sufferings of christ the death of his flesh so between his death and resurrection, what happened to Christ? When he died and in three days, his body was laying on the tomb. What happened to Christ? What did he do? So here, God, through Peter, revealed to us what happened. What happened was his living spirit went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. That is in verse 19. But the question remains, who are these spirits? in prison. Now there is much debate about the identity of these spirits in prison because the Greek pneuma in either singular or plural can either mean human spirits or angels depending on the context. So there are three common interpretations and we will look at each of them and the reason to support them but also we will look at uh, the, the interpretation that would best fit with the rest of the scripture and the historic orthodox Christian doctrine. And the first interpretation understands that the spirits, uh, which is pneumasin, that is the plural form of the word spirit, is referring to unsaved human spirits in Noah's day. So the first interpretation understands that the spirits here are, is referring to the unsaved human spirits in Noah's day. Christ in the Spirit proclaimed the gospel in the days of Noah through Noah. That's the first understanding. So the unbelievers who heard Christ preaching through Noah did not obey and are now suffering judgment because they are spirits in prison. And we have several reasons to support this view. Number one, Peter calls Noah a herald of righteousness in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 5, where herald represents the Greek kerex or preacher, which corresponds to the noun here used, uh, keruzo, proclaim. The second reason for this uh, interpretation is that Peter says the Spirit of Christ was speaking through the Old Testament prophets in chapter 1, verse 11. Thus, Christ could have been speaking through Noah as an Old Testament prophet. 
And lastly, the context indicates that Christ was preaching through Noah, who was in that time a persecuted minority. Nevertheless, God saved Noah, which is similar to what is happening in Peter's time. So Christ now is preaching the gospel through Peter and his readers to a persecuted minority, and God will save them like he did with Noah. That is the first interpretation of the spirits in prisons here, referring to the unsaved human spirits in Noah's days, where Christ proclaimed to them through Noah. The second interpretation believes that the spirits here are the fallen angels who are cast into hell to await final judgment. So if the first interpretation is the human spirits in the time of Noah, here the second interpretation believes that the spirits are the fallen angels who are cast into hell to await the final judgment. Reasons for supporting this view include, number one, some interpreters say that the sons of God in Genesis 6 verses 2 to 4 are angels who sinned by cohabiting or having physical relations with human women when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. The second reason for this is that almost without exception in the New Testament, spirits, the plural form of spirit, refers to supernatural beings rather than people. And finally, the word prison is not used elsewhere in Scripture as place of punishment after death for human beings, while it is used for Satan in Revelation 20 verse 7 and other fallen angels in 2 Peter 2 4 and Jude 6. Now, John MacArthur said, Between Christ's death and resurrection, his living spirit went to the demon spirits bound in the abyss and proclaimed that, in spite of his death, he had triumphed over them. This is the concept of John MacArthur, and I would incline to agree with him that within the three days between the death of Christ and his physical resurrection, his living spirit went to the demon spirits bound in the abyss or in prison and proclaiming to them not the gospel, but that in spite of his death, he, he, he is proclaiming to them that he has triumphed over them. Colossians 2, 14 to 15, Paul says, By canceling the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to, his, to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So, the spirits now in prison refers most likely to fallen angels or demons who were permanently bound because of their heinous wickedness, of their great wickedness. John MacArthur further suggested that the demons who are not so bound resist such a sentence. In the end, they will be all sent to the eternal lake of fire. Uh, that is in Matthew 25 verse 41 and Revelation 20 verse 10. The third view believes that the idea that Christ offered a second chance of salvation to those in hell. But this interpretation, however, is in direct contradiction with other scripture and with the rest of 1 Peter, and they must be rejected on biblical and theological grounds, leaving either uh, of the first two views as the most likely interpretation. Why would Christ not give a second chance with these spirits bound already in hell? Because in Luke 16, 26, it is Christ himself who revealed that there's a great chasm in the story of the Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, Christ said in that story that there is a great chasm between heaven and hell. And once you're in heaven, you cannot pass through. And once you're in hell, you cannot go through it to, to come out of it, to go to heaven. And Hebrews 9, 27 would, would tell us, it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And Peter further explains that the abyss is inhabited by demons who have been there since the time of Noah and who were sent there because they did not obey or they severely overstepped the bounds of God's tolerance with their wickedness. So John MacArthur suggested that the demons of Noah's days were running riot through the earth filling the world with their wicked, vile, and anti-God activity, including sexual sin, so that even 120 years of Noah's preaching while the ark was being built, 
It could not convince any of the human race beyond the eight people of Noah's family to believe in God. Thus bound these demons permanently in the abyss until their final sentencing. So um, what happened to Christ between his death and resurrection? He went and proclaimed his victory over the fallen angels, the disobedient demons since the time of Noah, of his victory over them. And what happened in the days of Noah? Uh, Peter further uh, explained there, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. The eight persons, the minority, who suffered after preaching for 120 years, and yet they were brought safely through water. Now, they had been rescued in spite of the water, not because of the water. So here, water was the agent of God's judgment, not the means of their salvation. They were saved from the water. But there is a uh, correlation here in verse 21. The figure there in verse 21, Peter says, Baptism, which corresponds to what happened in the days of Noah, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So a comparison is drawn between salvation in the ark and baptism. In both instances, believers are saved from the waters of judgment. But since baptism portrays salvation through judgment. So uh, there is a pastor that suggested, who suggested that Peter is teaching that the fact that eight people were in an ark and went through the whole judgment and yet were unharmed, this is analogous to the Christian's experience in salvation by being in Christ, by being baptized into Christ, the ark of one salvation. So by virtue of our relationship, of our oneness, of being united in Christ through baptism, the spiritual significance of our baptism, we are also saved. That's why Peter clarifies here that this is not, he's not referring to the water physical baptism because in verse 21 baptism now saves you but not the physical baptism because verse 21 he says not as a removal of dirt from the body so the mere act mechanical act of water baptism does not save for peter clearly says here that it does not remove the dirt from the body it does not cleanse us that passing of water over the body does not cleanse anyone but rather it is an appeal to God for a good conscience. Now the word appeal here has the idea of a pledge, which is agreeing to a certain conditions of a covenant with God, particularly the new covenant. So what saves a person plagued by sin and guilty conscience is not an external rite of going through water baptism, but the agreement with God to get in the ark of safety, who is the Lord Jesus, by faith in his death and resurrection. In other words, by virtue of our oneness, of our baptism, the spiritual significance of our baptism, by our faith in his death and resurrection, we are saved. So baptism, the unity of a believer with Jesus, saves you and I, a believer because it represents inward faith as evidenced by one's appeal to God for the forgiveness of sins. This is our appeal, a good conscience. And his last uh, description of um, uh, salvation through baptism here is in verse 22, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So furthermore, baptism saves only in so far as it is grounded in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism is a visual representation of the fact that Christians are clothed with Christ and in union with Christ when they share his victory over sin. That's why Galatians 3.27 says, for as, many as, uh, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So though Christians have disagreed about the proper mode of water baptism beginning in the early history of the church, Christians have generally agreed, irrespective of denominational differences, that water baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality of regeneration or the new life, which is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit and which may be received only by grace through faith.
Titus 3, 5, Paul tells us, God saved us, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We are not washed physically through our water baptism, but it is an outward symbol of the inward reality of this washing, of this renewal, of regeneration through the Holy Spirit that we received by faith, not because of any works done by us. And uh, finally, talking about Jesus who went to proclaim His victory over the spirits in prison since the days of Noah, and now he gives us this corresponding figure of how the salvation of Noah, of the minority of Noah in his days, correspond to our baptism. But only we are saved uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So finally, he describes Christ in verse 22 by telling us, Now Christ not only died or suffered once, not only he resurrected but in verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So after Jesus accomplished his work on the cross and was raised from the dead, he was exalted to the place of prominence, honor, majesty, authority, and power. The central truth of verses 18 to 22 is that Christ has triumphed over his enemies, the very enemies that were behind his own suffering. With angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him, he is now ascended to the right hand of God, and all angels and demonic powers, who may, may most likely be behind his own suffering at the cross, are now subjected to him since he is the Lord and the Christ. What a beautiful example of suffering here, from his death to his resurrection. Now he ends in victory, in ultimate triumph, because he is now at the right hand of God and all of his enemies are under his feet. So we will return to our question and we will take up an, a practical application for what we can learn from the example of the suffering of Christ here. And the question that we have asked for this lesson is this, how can the sufferings of Christ encourage and empower us in our own unjust sufferings? Why would Peter invoke this example? How can it encourage and empower us knowing that Christ has suffered? Our application for this lesson is this. We believers can rejoice in our sufferings knowing that Christ has triumphed. We believers can rejoice in our sufferings knowing that Christ has triumphed. The point of application to Peter's readers is that suffering can be the context for one's greatest triumph, as seen in the, in the example of the Lord Jesus. His suffering brought us salvation and victory over his enemies and ours. So our suffering, looking to his example and what it accomplished, should encourage us and make us rejoice in our own suffering. How? Why could I rejoice in my own suffering? Why could I be encouraged? Why could I be empowered in my own suffering? Because if I look to the example of Christ, I would know that in the end, we are not in defeat, but we have triumphed and conquered through Christ. So his, the, the victory of Christ is not without suffering. So we can continue to endure suffering and unjust sufferings if it is God's will knowing that we have salvation in Christ. So we can rejoice because we have salvation in Him. And this salvation came to us because He also went through unjust sufferings. And we can continue to rejoice and endure through unjust sufferings, knowing that we have a good conscience, continuing to be a good witness for Him. But most of all, we look forward for, his, for Jesus' complete actual victory over all his enemies when he will put an ultimate end to them like what he already prophesied in Revelation 20. So what we will take home from this, from this lesson is this, you and I can rejoice in our own sufferings knowing that Christ has triumphed. So my question to you is this, do you endure and rejoice in your own suffering 
knowing that Christ also suffered for you, became victorious, granted you salvation. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are not the only ones who are going through suffering. Especially, we will not be the only ones who would go through unjust sufferings. But your own son came, the righteous one, who suffered or died once for sins. The righteous one for us, the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to you. So that in his suffering, unjust sufferings, he proclaimed his victory over his enemies. Granting us salvation through our our oneness, our unity in Him, with Him, through His resurrection, that He rose from the dead, and now He is at your right hand in a position of authority, honor, and power, and that you have subjected His enemies under Him, knowing that we can rejoice in our own suffering because Christ has granted us salvation and Christ has triumphed over His enemies. So help us to endure, help us to rejoice in our own because we have Christ to look to. We thank you for your word and the encouragement that we receive from it. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us uh, for this uh, week's uh, lesson. And uh, uh, if the Lord wills, we hope to see you again and study with you again in our next episode with Word for the Week. Have a blessed week ahead.